Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, and uh, I want to I wanna tell you about Jesus, and I say that every week. Uh, have you ever had somebody that you kind of knew, you knew them from a distance or whatever, you kind of were familiar with them, uh, and then somebody else asked you about them, and you say, oh, I don't know if I like them. They're kind of, they're, they're, they're really stuck up, you know, it was like, it's like, well, stuck up? It's like, they're not stuck up. I was like, have you ever met them before? Well, I could just tell that they're stuck up. Or they're kind of weird and, or, or, or something like that. You've you got this made-up image of that. They're, they're really full of themselves. And then, then you do something one time and you're past intertwined and then you get to know them. And then later on you say, I thought you said that they were stuck up. I was like, man, I, I, I had no idea. They're not stuck up at all. They're, they're the nicest people I've ever met. And I just, I had no idea. Because sometimes from a distance... We, we kind of make up in our minds who somebody is or how, how their personality is or their character is or whatever. And I think that is even true with us, with God, that uh, we, we grow up hearing about God or we grow up hearing the stories or we grow up hearing about salvation, but it's from a distance. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you truly understand who he is. It wasn't just that God gave us the gospels and said, hey, you're sinners, Jesus came, he died, and he rose again, and you need salvation, born in a family, raised in a family, walked among men, gathered these guys together, fed the 5,000, walked on water, went through uh, death with them, went through victory with them. And, and at, at the end of it, they knew the character of Jesus. And you say, man, I wish I had that. But let me remind you, the reason why we gather in church and we open up our Bibles it's because we can have that ourselves to be able to understand and know the character of our God. And that's for us to do today is just to dive into this and understand who he is. Jesus just finished his teaching. If you remember last week in Mark chapter 4, at the beginning of it, he's given the parable of the sowers. And he, and he gave the illustration of the plants. He said that sometimes the seed uh, falls on hard ground. It goes nowhere. It just, and, and that's sometimes with, with some people. It's like they hear the gospel. It's like, man, I don't care about that. That's not my thing. I don't want to be preached at. But sometimes it falls on that shallow soil. It, it grows a little bit, but there's no roots. So there's no fruit. But then it says that it, it eventually just fades away because there was no depth to it. Or he gets choked out by the, the care of this, of this world and something happens and it doesn't last. And he gave this preaching and this teaching. Well, Jesus was in a boat. The crowd was so massive around him that Jesus couldn't actually, he was being pressed by the crowd. So he got into a boat and they kind of, if you can imagine, like me being in the water and you guys being on the shore, they took the boat and they pushed it out a little bit. And then he could, all of a sudden, he could gather the crowd around him on the shore. And Jesus stands in this boat and begins to preach. Now, I'm going to tell you guys, he was 100% God. The Bible says when he preached, he preached as one as had authority. Jesus had authority. He's preaching. He's teaching. And man, they knew there was something different about him. But he was also 100% God. 100% man. 100% God. 100% man. He was the son of God. He was the son of man. And it emphasizes back and forth all through scripture. So in this passage, we kind of get a glimpse of this. So he's in this boat already, and he says to the disciples, hey, let's go to the other side. Jesus had a plan for this. And the same day, in verse 35, Mark 4, 35, and the same day when evening was calm, he saith unto them, let us pass over to the other side. And when he had sent them away the multitude, they took with him even as he was in the ship. Just stop right there. And they took him even as he was in the ship. Now, what does that mean? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly what's going on in this passage, but how Jesus was is how they took him. And, and it emphasizes this. And, 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 and knowing the story that we're about to get into, Jesus falls asleep. I can imagine Jesus finishing up. And I'm not trying to read into Scripture. I'm just trying to say that it's in there. And the Bible doesn't explain it all in detail. But as he's in this ship and he like sits down and is like, guys, let's just go to the other side. He doesn't get out. He doesn't greet the people. He doesn't do healings. He doesn't do any of those things. He just sits down and I can imagine there's a pillow and he snuggles up with the pillow and he falls asleep. You know why? Does anybody know why? He was tired. 100% God, 100% man. So he falls asleep. And there was with him other little ships. We don't know what that was. I can imagine if he was in a boat and he was teaching and people were in other boats, they would get around him and like want to get close to him. It's like, man, I, I got a really cool view of Jesus as he's teaching. 
But then when he went to the other side, you know, these guys are like, hey, let's go see where he's going. So the Bible doesn't explain, but the details are in there, but it doesn't explain these details. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, and it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the, sheep, uh, of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and he rebuked the wind and said unto the, the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, I, I, I know we know this story. If I was to ask you guys, how many have never heard of this story? I, there, there might be a couple people, but I, I, I'm going to say for the most part, we know this story. I've preached this many times. I heard it when I was a kid. I heard it in uh, Sunday school and Awana and all these kind of things. It's not an unfamiliar story, but the question is, God wasn't just trying to entertain us and say, let me tell you a story. There's, there, there, there's a meaning behind it. So the thing is, I want to know is why did God let this happen and what's the lesson that's part of this? He, he called the disciples and he's teaching them how to handle life. And I, I think for all of us, we, we have this mindset that we know how to do life. You know what I'm saying? I, I know how to work a job and I know how to handle this and know how to handle that. And it's, it's just part of routine. But what Jesus was trying to teach them is that we have to be dependent on him for everything. It's not just in hard times. It's not just in difficulties. It's the concept that we need him. He is our help. And it's not just in a time of trouble. He is our help with everything. So he's teaching them to do life. But I tell you that what Jesus is about to tell them in this situation or teach them in this situation was going to change them, drastically change them. And I'll show you at the end of the story. So this was a weird thing. So they get into the boat, but it, it, the Bible says that it's evening has now come. You would not normally get into a boat, go to the other side of Galilee, during a time of a storm or a time of a a potential storm. Let me put it like that. And the disciples knew this. The reason why I say that is the the Sea of Galilee was about 13 miles one way and about eight miles the other way. So it wasn't like gigantic, but it was pretty big. And because it was surrounded, we've got these pictures, because it was surrounded by these mountains, uh, and in this, the Sea of Galilee was in the middle of it, and it had all these giant hills around it. So you'd have this, uh, uh, this warmer air down here, and then you'd have the colder air that was over the mountains. If you've ever been up in the mountains, you know what I'm talking about. And if the wind would blow, it would actually mix that together, and all of a sudden, storms would erupt out of nowhere. It was kind of like this, this, this bowl, <clears throat> and it would, things would drastically happen in moments. That's why a lot of times they didn't go at night to things. So this was even weird in of itself. But I mean, you don't question Jesus, okay? Jesus said, let's go to the other side. He's in the boat. He has a plan. You know, everything's going to be okay. He's, he's taking care of this. Remember, seven of the disciples were fishermen. So it wasn't like a weird, odd thing that they'd never experienced its storms before. I mean, they were like, we've got this. And I think that's part of the lesson in life for a lot of us. It's like, I've got this. Man, I've been doing this a long time. I think even in ministry, we can have as pastors. It's like, I know the routine. I've got this. I know what to do. But this is what happens. And there arose in verse 37, and there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. It says a great storm. So it's literally... Uh, wording is like a mega storm and something abnormal. It was, it was more intense than typical. It speaks about the wind. It says that it beat against the boat. I, I, I remember going on a boat when we went to uh, Michigan one time and we did deep sea fishing and we were going out. There wasn't even a storm, but the waves were so intense that you were, you were driving the boat into the waves, and it's just like, has anybody done this before? And the waves are just like, bam, bam. And you're just sitting there, you're doing this thing like this over and over. And the thing about it is, it doesn't just go away. It's not like, okay, let's stop for a minute. You're in the middle of the water, and if the waves are like that, it's just, it's just one after another. You can imagine, I can endure anything for a minute, but this is like... Just imagine this, okay? They're being beat by these and going from one side to the other. So I can't get a grip. I can't, I can't sit down. I can't get comfortable. They're just, and their emotions are being built up because they're thinking, I've, I've been in storms, but this is getting bad. 
And our minds begin to think, I'm going to die. Actually, in verse 40, when Jesus confronts them, he, it describes them as they were overwhelmed with fear. Literally, I am going to die. This is going to be the end. And they literally said that in the passage. And there rose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat on the ship so that it was now full. Does anybody know? I know you might not be a fisherman. Does, does anybody know what happens to boats when they're full? It's not good. I, I, I mean, and, that's, and it's not like the boats that we have nowadays, you know, that they have, you know, foam built into the edges so that they can not sink and they can only sink so far or whatever. No, no, I mean, this is, they, they were literally at the end. So they have done everything that they could possibly do. So what, what was left to do at this point? It's like, there, there's, there's nothing. You, you can't catch your breath. It's not stopping. It's not slowing down. You are exhausted. But I, I've titled this that he is our help. But I, I want you to know that it goes deeper than that. I really want to, to emphasize that he is our everything. But in this, I want you to see how he's our help. In church right now, I, I know we would get a, amen, brother, that's true. You know, because we all agree with that. We want to share that. We want that truth to be known. You can't do anything without him. But the question is, they were trying to. They had Jesus in the boat, and they were going under. They had Jesus in the boat, and they were going under. You say, what, what is that? You guys know what I'm talking about. Have you ever thought, I have Jesus in my life, and I am falling apart? I have Jesus in my life, and I am an utter mess. I have Jesus in my life, and I am struggling beyond description. We say Jesus is our everything, but I don't know if we live as Jesus is our everything. I, I don't know if we live as if Jesus, that we're hopeless and desperate without God. And it says, and there rose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat on the ship, so it was now full. So get the visual of the disciples. Water is pouring into the ship. It's raining. Wind and waves are throwing them around, and there's nothing they can do. I mean, I'd imagine they got just to the point where they just like, okay, this is about to go under any second. There is nothing we can do. And this is where it hits home. I know I'm preaching the Bible story, whatever, but there's application to this because he gave it to us to preach today. So it's just a history lesson. There's going to be spots in your life where there is nothing left for you to do except you're waiting to go under. A situation right now, a story, a problem, whatever, you just go like, whew, oh man. I mean, just the thought of this is just, just, you know, just, just heavy. You guys know our story where Logan goes in for chemo tomorrow. It's his, it's his second round of his, of his second cycle of this. And, and last we heard, it's, it's not doing anything. It's, it's, it's not growing from what we know. But the last thing showed that it's not, it's not shrinking it anymore. Uh, we don't have another option that they're putting on the table right now. I'm not saying that there's not one, but right now they're not putting one. We got a, a message and they just said that we're just going to ride this out. I'm like, ride what out? It's like, well, there's nothing to ride out. And can, can I tell you guys what I can do right now? Nothing. I, I go to Jenny, and Jenny can tell you this. I said, we need to give him more vitamin C. C. And she goes, we can't just keep giving him vitamin I, We, we got to do something. You just, from, from every angle, and let me tell you, we've got phone calls and all this other stuff. But there comes a point in all of our lives where we know that there is nothing left that you can do. There's nothing left. But this is a visual. I can tell you, I wasn't in the boat, but I can tell you what they were doing. They're like, okay, let's get this water out of here. And so we're not going to go under. Hey, guys, there's a little water in the back. Grab that bucket, man. Man, it's really coming down today. Man, these waves are crazy. But then it kept intensifying. It, it, was, it just kept getting worse. And they're, 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 they're trying. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. They're, they're trying, and we, we do this. And, and I, th- I think we can all relate to this. Because when we get into a problem, now, now by the way, I've, I've got Jesus, but I've got my job, and I've got my 401k, and I'll just take on some more hours. 
I'll knock this out. I know what to do. I know how to work hard. I'm no, I'm no sissy. I, I, I can make this happen. So we just go to work. But let me tell you what happens when you are working, 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 but you're still going under. It affects you mentally. It affects you spiritually. It, you're, you're tired. You're exhausted. You're bitter. You're, you're mad. You're, you're frustrated. It's like, I'm just, the, the, imagine the disciples. We're only doing this because he said to get in the boat. He said, I thought this was crazy. Why am I listening to Jesus? He said, get in the boat. What's he doing? He's doing nothing. Did you see him back there? All he's doing is sleeping. You don't believe me that they had this? They didn't walk up to Jesus and say, oh, thou wonderful Savior. You know the story. You know what they said. They question his character. See, when we get into situations, we run to people, we post on Facebook, life is so hard right now. I don't know what I'm going to do. When we cry and whine. I'm, I'm just being real, okay? Has problems ever changed because we make a sad post? And I'm not saying to reach out for help, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just being real with you right now. Just in a situation, we do what kind of feels good in the moment. Like, I'm going to work harder. I'll take out more hours. I'll talk to my friends. I'll, 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 I'll. We do all these different things, but they were doing everything in their strength. But the Bible says that they got to the point where the boat was now full. Let me say it again. They had Jesus in the boat, but they were about to sink. How can we know the master of the universe and still be going under? Yes, he is our help. But can I notice, can I point you to our response is that we have to learn to seek him. So what is the difference? What made the change or the shift in the story? What changed everything? In verse 38 And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest not that we perish. So Jesus was chilling in the boat. And now here's the thing. Now get this visual. I want you guys to get this visual in your mind. That you can be sinking and have Jesus this close. And in our lives... When we're on Facebook and we're doing this and doing that, working all this, and, and then just like, and, and have, have the Son of God inside of our lives literally that close and still be a mess. But the answer to this, I'm not saying their approach was right, but the, the action of what they did is they sought Jesus. What, what, what I'm preaching right now is very personal to me. And I know I'm going to sound like a broken record because I say this stuff all the time. I, re- I remember this, and, and, and I'm sorry if, I, if, if you're just like, here he goes again, telling another story. Okay, this, this is just where I'm at, okay? It's me. I remember going through the initial shock when Logan was first diagnosed. We spent days in the ICU, PET scan, CT scan, MRI scan, blood work, bone marrow biopsy, uh, just the chest biopsy. He, he couldn't, uh, just like, he was just like, whoa. I mean, it was just like the waves were beating on us. And I remember getting to the point where we were in a room and he, they, they started this advanced stage of chemo treatments and all this other stuff that we were doing. And I just was so like, what in the world? And I, I remember telling Jenny at different times that I would just, I would go for walks and I would go buy us coffee or do whatever, but I, I just couldn't stay still. And I remember walking down the street by, by Children's Hospital. I'm walking and I'm praying. And I remember being so real with God, just saying, God, I really desperately need you. And I am, I, I'm not saying that I heard a voice, but I'm going to tell you, it was almost like God whispering back to me and said, Tony, you've always really desperately needed me. But I don't think we recognize that until we feel like we're going under, until I feel like that I'm losing everything. And, and I, I just feel like this is the Christian life. There's so many of us doing this. Trying, trying. And I talk to people and just like, Pastor Tony, I'm trying so hard. I'm, I'm just working at Pastor Tony. I'm in the middle of the storm and whatever. And, and, and let me tell you the big part of this story. And I want you to get this because it's so vitally important that we don't build up a God in our minds that doesn't actually exist. That the point of this story was not call on to Jesus and he makes the storms go away. Because that's how we talk about this stuff. 
And that's where we get bitter against God because we want, we want just, wake him, get Jesus. He snaps his finger, rebukes my situation. Peace comes, it's over. And I, I think that's where we're after. But do you realize that there's a lot more going on in this story than just peace be still? Because a lot of times when we preach it, I've heard it preached before. You, you're in the boat and the storm's hitting you hard. But let me tell you, Jesus calms the storm. And everybody says amen. And we shout and we sing a song about he's the master of the wind. And we go home and life just stinks. So let's get real. This storm was a sermon illustration by Jesus because it was an illustration that in the storm you have no control. And I think so we can get so good at just going through life that we don't mentally think, I need God in this, because we don't think that we need God in everything. There's a verse that I say this all the time, but I want you to see this. In, in John 15, 5, when Jesus was teaching the disciples, and we talked about the, the, the plant and the vines and the fruit and things like this, but talking about what comes out of our lives. And he says this, he, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Literally, it's, it's not just a matter of being the first plant that we talked about last week where there's nothing coming out of it. It's the second plant where you literally are thriving in the things that God has given us. It's the, to bear fruit, the fruit of the spirit, things coming out of life, spiritual uh, victories and things like that. <clears throat> but his point with this that it's not about needing God in hard times. It's about needing God at all times. Because without me, you can absolutely do nothing. You can't. But I think in life, we have a lot of Christians talking about how hard I'm working. But in reality, we're, we're supposed to be seeking after Jesus in everything that we do. In everything. Every aspect. But the Bible says that the boat was now full. And one of them thinks and says, hey, we should wake him up. I, I don't know what's going through their mind. I don't know what, if it was a person, but I, I know it. it says in verse 38, and they wake him. This is where the breakthrough, it is, it's, he, the Bible says that he's in the back part of the ship. It says it in the same passage, so I don't know if it's the guy in the front. And the bow's going all over the place, and it's, water's coming in, and it's filled with water. And it's dangerous, and one of them climbing all over everything and falling and whatever, and lands on Jesus and shakes him or whatever that happened. I don't know, it just gives a description. But I, I know that they had it in their mindset that they had to get to Jesus in this situation. And, and I think, honestly, and, and I, I've had people debate with me on this, and I don't know, I don't know how Jesus was truly awake, but some people said, if the Bible says he was sleeping, he was sleeping. But if the boat was now full, I mean, I, I, can you sleep while you're in a boat full of water? I, I don't know, but I, I think Jesus was, maybe, was just over there with one eye open going, what a bunch of dummies. It's like, what are we going to do? And he's like, doing this, like... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And, and I, I know I'm not trying to read into the Bible, but I'm just like, he is the master. He's the healer. He's all this. And they're over there with the bucket. Doesn't make sense. But I, I, I think that what is happening here is they pursued after Jesus. It's not just about knowing Jesus or pointing to Jesus or knowing his name or following after him. There's something deeper that happens in this, and that is seeking after Jesus. And, and, and if, you've, if you've been with me for the last two years, you know my heart when it comes to this. I sincerely believe that what's missing in the lives of Christians is the fact that we're not pursuing or seeking, truly seeking after Jesus. And, and I you just say, I pray and I pray and I pray. Can I tell you that there's another level that the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. And the, the idea of seek, if, if you've ever, how many of you guys, let's go old school. How many of you guys have ever played hide and seek? Raise your hand right now. Okay. You know what I'm talking about. It, you, you, you said like uh, 89, 90, 91, you get to 100, and you're trying, ready or not, here I come, and then you, and then you go seeking after them. Do you, you know what it is? I, I, I need to find where they're at. So I start going like, I'm, I'm, I'm action. It's not just like, where are you guys? We know you're somewhere. No, you, you're, 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 you're looking all through the yard. You're doing all this. We used to play these games with kids all the time, and it had a blast. But you're seeking after something that you're missing. 
The word seek is used in the Bible a lot. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. But that's where a lot of times we stop it. If you call by my name, humble yourselves and pray. God, I need you. And we do. But it doesn't stop there. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. There's an action involved in these things. They, they demonstrate in the literal sense of going after something, of knowing who he is and, 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 and wanting more of it or wanting it in my life or wanting to experience for myself. And the whole idea of seek the face of God, it's, it's not just a matter of a, a phone call of how you're doing and that's how our prayer is. God, how are you doing? It, it, it's a matter of if I want to seek the face of Jen, I'm going to walk up to her. I, I want to be in her presence I want to see her in, 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 in my circumstance. I, I want you right here in my life. And, and I think what God wants for churches and family and cancer and everything else, it's not just to talk about God, but to experience the very presence of God, to go after it, not just to talk about it. Let me give you a really dumb illustration. Some of you are thinking, all your illustrations are really dumb. I don't know, it's just... I'm going to make a statement. You guys listen to me, okay? The grocery store has food. Will you agree with it? Say amen if you believe that. Amen, brother. The grocery store has food. I believe that the grocery store has food. Man, I'll, let me tell you about Kroger. I can tell you where it is. I can tell you I can walk in that Kroger. I can walk down an aisle and I can find a cake mix and chocolate, vanilla, I can find it in strawberry. I can find all the different toppings to it, all these other things. The grocery store has food. You want pizza? Let me tell you, there's a, there, let me, there is a pizza aisle in the grocery store. Did you guys know that? I, I tell you what, I, sometimes I get so excited about that grocery store that I, I, I just tweet about it. I, I post a thing and I let everybody know. The grocery store has food. Do you, do you know how great the grocery store it is? A, it is a wonderful thing. Man, I, I, I like, man, can I just sing you a song about the grocery store? Some of you are like, please, no. But man, how awesome is that grocery store? It is, it is let's sing with me on the chorus. How, how awesome is that grocery store? It's got food down every aisle. How awesome is that grocery store? The problem is, is I'm hungry. But let's sing another song about the grocery store. <laughs> All right, can we do that? Woo, man, it's got, it's got a bread aisle, baby, and I like bread. Let's sing about the bread aisle. And you say, that's stupid. Oh, you have no idea how stupid that is. Because if I'm truly hungry, I'm going to go to the grocery store. But I feel like we, we have created a culture of Christians that we, 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 we sing about the power of God and we sing about the presence of God and we sing about the hand of God and we, we, we tweet about it. We wear the t-shirts. We've got the bumper stickers. We've got the backpacks. We've got you, you, everything. We're, we're logoed to death about the power of God, the presence of God, and the goodness of God. We've got the memes that we post. We've got the songs that we sing. We'll sit in the car and, and, and cry and wave our hands and get all emotional and excited about the fact that God is all of those things. And then the instruction and well, the, the problem is we get so frustrated. I'm just so hungry and I don't understand if the grocery store has food. Why am I not experiencing being fulfilled? Because we talk about it rather than seek it. And that is a major problem in our churches today. And we've got a lot of frustrated people that is going through this because I can say, and the reason why we're studying all this right now is, is to understand that when I, when I truly understand who Jesus is, he's not just Jesus. He is peace. He is help. He is my strength. He is the wisdom. Whatever. So all of a sudden, when I'm thinking I'm going under, but he's the answer. I seek after him. And, it's, and, and I know that mindset can be when you get in trouble, just run after him. It goes deeper than this. 
God doesn't want to be more, he wants to be more than song lyrics and history lessons. He, he wants your presence. He wants you to seek after him. When, when Jesus was teaching about prayer in Matthew chapter 7, he said, ask and it shall be given unto you. And we're like, praise God, I'm going to ask to death. I'm going to ask, 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 ask. Oh, it's not finished. Oh, you shall find, seek, and you shall find. There's another level to it. There's more to it. This seeking that we get, it's the word seek in, in the Hebrew and in the Greek. When you break it down, it means to search out. By any method, specifically in worship or prayer. By implication, it means to strive after, to ask or beg or desire, to make a request, to seek for. This is where I truly believe that things change in our lives. It's just a matter of, and I know they did this after frustration, but what God is looking for us to say that you are my peace and for us to, to, to have that time and, and to fast and pray, to, to, it's, it's an action. Seeking is an action to deny ourselves for the sake of wanting more. And to understand that when I come to church, when I come to church, I'm not just coming here today because I'm going to check a box. But I, I'm asking God, I am looking for you. I want you to fill my cup. I want you to touch my heart. I want you to move in my kids. I am here because I'm looking for something because I know who you are. I know who you are. I'm not going to get off my knees. It's now just, now I lay me down to sleep or say the prayer or can we rush through this? When's the last time you got lost in prayer? When's the last time we just turned off the TV? When's the last time you sat with your Bible and it's not just the Bible app that it says read one, two, and three, and then repeat after me. But when we get there and just say, God, I, I want to know who you are. I crave who you are. To worship. And not just sit in your car and let other people tell you how great he is. But you put those words into prayer and worship, and you tell them how great he is. There is a difference. But I think this kumbaya Christianity of feel good and talk about it and everything, is, it, it's shallow. And as a result of that, we're, we're more about talking about how great God is. And then we get to the point where we're frustrated and we get bitter in our hearts. So we're coming to confront Jesus for him not caring about us. To seek after him. Later in the passage, it says in, in verse 41, it's that they say, what manner of man is this that even the, the winds and the seas obey him? They viewed Jesus different. But I want you to know they would have never known this. Guys, they would have never known this unless they went to the storm. And right now your storm is not to break you or ruin you, but if to discover how great he is. And the fact that he is more than just Jesus. He is the one that brings peace. He's more than just Jesus. He's the one that brings help. He's the strength that you seek after. Say things like, I want to be like David. I want to see giants fall. And we, we, man, I've got giants too. Let me sing that song. But when you get into the life of David, can I tell you, the Bible says, and I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Why do we go straight to peace be still and giants fallen and we skip the ones that are on their face before God, humbling themselves, fasting and seeking after the power of God? To know him, to be in his presence. Seeking God should not be the last thing we do because we are sinking, but the first thing we do because we know we are helpless without him. Amen. In every aspect of our lives. I don't run to him when I'm going under. I run to him before I get in the boat. I just don't thank him for the peace be still. I thank him for the fact that I have a boat. I thank him for the bucket. Thank him for the people in the boat and the sunshine that breaks through. When they woke him up, the question that they had asked him, notice this. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And when they awake him, saying unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The question that God asked was, listen this. 
and this says so much about the scenario, the situation, was not like they went up to Jesus and said, can you help us? They didn't go up to Jesus and ask the question, can you display your power in this extreme situation? Lord, can you rebuke the wind? Can you be that peace in our lives? The question that they asked him, listen to this, was do you care? Did you guys get that? They go after Jesus to ask the question, do you care? You know where it came from? Doing this without seeking God. <laughs> I'm, we're about to die. I'm only here because I followed you. Trying so hard. And our minds go crazy. You guys know what I'm saying. Your mind goes crazy. You begin to ask God, where are you? Why don't you care? Why aren't you intervening? Why aren't you changing things? The word care in this passage means to be of interest, to have concern, to ask if it matters. Literally, do, 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 do you, does it matter to you? Do I matter to you? But Jesus had a follow-up question. You just say, does he care? That He wanted them to learn that he cares but it follows something else. He says in verse 40, and why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? The question that he asked them in response was, do you trust me? Do you know why it's so important to battle the question in our minds if God cares? Because I'll tell you what, if I'm struggling through life with cancer or pill, uh, bills or anything like that, and you, I have it in my mind that he doesn't care, then I'm not going to run to him. Do you understand the spiritual worth that's coming in there? To not know the character of God. If I don't know his character, then I'm going to almost be the other way. That it drives me, the storm will drive me to be bitter towards God. Like, you don't even care about my kids. You don't care about my life. You don't care that I'm going under. You don't care. And the truth of the matter is he cared very much so. The question that he asked him is like, do you trust me? And if you trust me, why are you working so hard and wearing yourself out rather than come to me? Because if you trusted me, you'd seek me. Do you seek him? The Bible says that he rose up and he rebuked the wind. And I know, man, basically this is where pastors would go like, let me tell you, he rebuked the wind and the wind ceased to whenever, but we skip this part. We want so much that drastic change in our lives, but we're not understanding that we have to put down the bucket and seek after the one who is the master of the wind and the maker of the rain. Jesus is teaching us that only he can bring revival. He's teaching us that only, only he can, you, you're doing this, but only he can fix your marriage. Only he can... Revive your hearts, reach your kids, change your circumstances, bring you strength, calm the storm, bring peace. Only Jesus can bring peace to a situation that you have already labeled as it's over, we're going under. I'm not asking you for help anymore because I don't even believe you care. We're about to die. But it's never too late. It was never too late. The storm changed them. Can I show you something that was powerful of this? You talk about why am I going through this right now? Because God wants to change you. He wants you to, he, he wants to go more than just like, I trusted Jesus when I was five to knowing that he is my everything. Because they discovered who Jesus was. There's, a, there's two words that I want to emphasize in verse 40. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? He asked them the question. The word fearful means something different than the verse 41. And they feared exceedingly. One of them was before, when they were doing this, they feared. Do you know what that word there in that passage means? Timid. They, they, they were over there like, we're going to die, guys. This isn't going to work. I, I don't know. I thought he was greater than this. But we're going under. He's not, a, he's not what we thought he was. But then after Jesus did this, the, 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 the word changes. And he says, then they feared him. It wasn't feared like being afraid of them. The word feared in that passage means to be in awe. Do you know what happened after they experienced who Jesus was in the storm? After they saw him, they were this. Who are you? Who are you that even the winds and the seas obey him? You are my strength. You are that wisdom. God, you are that help. You are the strength that I don't have. You are all of those things. God does care. 
he's just waiting for you to put down the bucket to seek after him to discover who he is so he can change your life. The story is not about the storm going away. The story goes deeper than that. The story is so much deeper than that. The story is about you discovering who Jesus is. Can I show you a a final part of this that I think is so cool? I think this is so powerful. That is the fact that in this story right here, you can imagine as they wake him up and say, do you not even care? Do you know what Jesus could have easily did? Like, is that your attitude? Go ahead. I'll make it to the other side, but you guys just suffer through this. Go ahead and make this boat. Try to to paddle a boat that's filled with water. Question my authority. But he did it. Even after they question his character, he stands up and he rebukes the wind. Do you know what that is called? It's grace. Man, it's grace. When I'm, when I'm frustrated and I'm like, oh, oh, you know, just like, what in the world? God still reaches out to us in return that handful of grace to say, you know what? I love you. I'm just bringing you through something to make you better. I, I want you to know that he cares deeply about you. But sometimes in your circumstance, you're going to feel like he doesn't. I I, I want us to have open eyes as we study this to to discover who is my Jesus and your Jesus. Some of you are over here and you know it. You're sitting in this room right now. You're, you're, You're almost a little frustrated, a little bitter toward Jesus. You're exhausted, you're tired, you're worn out. You know what I'm talking about. I challenge you to seek him.